Good morning. Uh, today, our speaker is Dave Beasley. Dave has worked for six years with uh, theoretical physics division at Los Alamos on molecular dynamics co. He is currently a graduate student at the University of Utah. Dave's research interests cover many areas of scientific computing. Among them is steering computation. Um, to people who have experience in building code using bases, we will, fi we will find uh, uh, the, steer the concept of steering computing very sounds very familiar. Um, Dave is the author of a software development tool called SWIG. Today, Dave is going to tell us about steering computation and the power of SWIG. Dave? And, and other things. Uh, can you hear me okay? On the, okay, great. Um, what I'm really going to talk about is um, it's really the result of, um, of a research project that I've been working on for about five years now and to do um, large-scale molecular dynamics modeling at Los Alamos. And this has been done with a number of collaborators, Peter Lomdahl, Suja Zhou, uh, Brad Holian, Niels Jensen, Wim Kerr, um, Tim German. A whole bunch of people have worked with this on this. And, and, and really what I'm going to talk about, you know, for the most part, is, is sort of a, a, a frustration that we experience trying to do this to do this work. I mean, we spent a lot of time trying to develop code, and we basically got nowhere with it due to a variety of problems. And so we have since been looking at, at, at steering as, an, as a solution to some of these problems for the last year. So that's what I'm going to talk about, is some of the things that we've been working on. And, and just briefly to, to cover what I'm going to go through, is talk a little bit about background, and then I'm going to talk a lot about what I call scientific woes. It's just sort of I mean, we spent several years pulling, pulling our hair out over a whole bunch of problems. And I'm going to talk about steering. And finally, I'm going to talk about some tools that we've done with, some things we've done with scripting languages and a tool called SWIG that I'll mention later. And then I'd like to give a demo and talk about what we're, what we're working on right now. And the only disclaimer that I would make is that this is very much work in progress. I mean, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about, I, didn't, I mean, I'm working on right now. And some of the things in the demo, I didn't even get working until like three days ago. It's, so it, it's, very, you know, it's very much current in, in terms of what we're working on. And I'm really excited you know, to tell other people about it and where we're going with this. So the problem, um, just to give you an idea what, what the problem is we're, we're solving, is we're doing short-range molecular dynamics simulation, which is basically just a big high school physics problem from hell. Um, you're trying to solve F equals MA for a you know, collection of N particles. It just happens that for us, N is on the order of you know, maybe 10 million to 100 million. And what we're trying to use this for is our, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to study things like three-dimensional cracks and, and you know, dislocation dynamics and things like that. Um, the physics of this simulation is actually encoded into, into a potential energy function. And that's, that's, that's a whole other area of complexity that I'm not going to talk about here. And the basic algorithm is in, in these simulations basically figure out what particles interact with each other because they're sort of a limited range. And once you know that, just calculate the forces and integrate the equations of motion and, and repeat that process until you're, until you're bored out of disk space or have blown all your money on the, on the parallel machine. So the code that we've done to, that we've been working on is, we started this in 1992 um, actually, it's a project for the Connection Machine 5 we got at Los Alamos at that time. Um, the goal, like I said earlier, we wanted to study 3D fracture, um, dislocations. Uh, we were interested in sort of this transition between ductile and brittle behavior in materials and, and various other material properties as they came up. Um, we developed a code called SPASM, which stands for uh, Scalable Parallel Short-Range Molecular Dynamics. Um, Mainly, we just needed something to, you know, that would kind of irk our you know, management higher up you know, when they had to talk about this. So we needed a good acronym for it. Um, in 1992, we actually used this code. We could simulate molecular dynamics simulations with 100 million atoms. And previous to that time, the largest simulation that we knew about was about a million atoms. It had been done for several months on an IBM 3090. So we really, I mean, we blew away that record by two orders of magnitude. Um, the following year, we actually we did some optimizing for the CM5 and got one of the I, one of the Gordon Bell prizes for um, running running this application at 50 gigaflops on our 1,024 node new machine. Um, after that, we ported this code to a whole variety of machines. Um, ported to the Cray T3D. We've done some stuff on the Fujitsu um, SGIs and Sun multiprocessors and things like that. And after all of that. 
I mean, we spent a long time, you know, we say we need performance and we need portability. And, you know, this is great. Um, we really weren't learning that much scientifically because what, and, and, and sort of, you know, we got to thinking, you know, why is this, you know, why is this code so difficult to use? I mean, we have a code that runs fast. We have a code that runs on a variety of machines, yet, you know, code really wasn't that useful. And, you know, and so really what, you know, we got to thinking about this, you know, why is this, why is this so difficult? So a couple of problems. The first problem is that we really had too much data. Um, you know, like I said, prior to 1992, the largest simulations usually only evolved a few hundred thousand atoms. And 1994, we actually ran, you know, a production run with 104 million particles. And to give you an idea what this required, I mean, this simulation ran for 180 hours on a 512 node machine. It generated 41.6 gigabyte data files. And even those were pretty scaled back. I mean, they only held four scalar quantities and stored in single precision. And the only reason we did that is we simply don't have a disk quota enough to save more files. I mean, if we had our way, we would have dumped hundreds of files that on the order of two to three gigabytes for this simulation. And so in order to run something like that, I mean, we have this problem, you know, where do we put this data? Because, you know, we're just, we're, we're in the, you know, theory division. We don't get any, we don't get, you know, big disk quotas in the computing center. So, you know, where do you put this data? How do you analyze it? I mean, where do you, where, what do you give a 1.6 gigabyte data file to to analyze? Um, what do you analyze it with? And how do you get it there? I mean, you know, one of the problems is, you know, we, can, we might not be able to use a machine in the computing center, so how do we get it to our own machine? Yeah. You know, I presume this is a time-dependent code, so why wouldn't you just periodically stop the code, look at the data, and then delete the file and then go on? Um, we can do that. But it, I mean, even dealing with one of these files is, is a problem. So, so there, yeah, there is a definite. I mean, you can't. We in, in actually doing this simulation, we ran this over about two weeks and dumped off about half the data periodically through the simulation. And sort of the problem in molecular dynamics. I mean, this is a hundred million particles. Um, Oak Ridge, at about the same time, did a test simulation with a billion particles on their Paragon. Um, I hate to think how much data you would generate if you actually tried to do a real simulation with that many particles. So that's sort of the first problem. We're just completely overwhelmed with data on this simulation. Um, kind of a second problem I think is more general is, I mean, one of the things we're trying to do is do 3D simulations with, with MD. And when you go to 3D, I mean, you need these very large system sizes because of the extra dimension. and you also get this problem of all of a sudden now you've got very complex geometries. Um, you need some way to look at your data, you know, 3D graphics or, uh, you know, things like that, feature detection. You know, how do you deal with these very complex 3D data sets? You know, and prior to this time, I mean, we'd been using tools on our workstation just to do 2D simulations. I mean, we could write a program to plot points and, and do things, but 3D really broke everything that we had. And I think it's, you know, safe to say that, you know, writing your own software to do 3D, I mean, working with a lot of physicists in, in our group, I mean, we just don't, I mean, it's very difficult to go and say, yeah, I want to go write my own 3D visualization and data analysis tool because it's so complex. So, you know, we sort of relied, I mean, we had to rely on third-party tools and libraries to do this kind of stuff. Which gets us to the, the really fun part. Um, we call tool hell here. Um, I mean, the way this worked, I mean, we had all this data set. So we went to the computer center and we said, you know, can you guys help us out? And the first thing that they offered us was, was AVS, which has, have any of you used that? Okay. AVS was horrible. I mean, first of all, we couldn't figure out how to use it because I, I mean, maybe, maybe we're just not that smart or something, but this, this whole plumbing thing, it was just totally confusing to all the users how to use that, okay? Um, I mean, I would, I would, you know, say try giving AVS a 1.6 gigabyte data file sometime. We actually tried giving it a 180 megabyte data file um, to produce, let me see, to produce this picture. This picture was not generated with AVS, actually. Um, we tried to give it this data set, and the only machine had enough memory to handle it because da AVS made so, com so many copies of the data, it was a 256 processor connection machine. And we had, I mean, we had an SGI Onyx with, you know, 256 megabytes of memory in it, and that, that wasn't, certainly couldn't do that on that. You should try teapots instead. 
TFOS? No, that, that's, 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 Utah, that's Utah stuff. You guys. <laughs> uh, the performance is just terrible. I mean, we tried to make a, we tried to make a movie. You know, I don't know. You have to make movies, I guess. Uh, back in like 1994 sometime. And we ran this simulation. We produced, we, we produced a, thousand one meg, a thousand data files, about 20 megabytes each. There's only a one million atom simulation. It's pretty small. Uh, running this simulation took only about three hours on a 128 node processor machine. Did it in an afternoon. And then when we tried to make this movie out of it, uh, I mean, this is horrible. We had two guys that tried to do it in ABS. Uh, they spent about a day or so trying to figure out how to do it. And, and I, you know, I got totally frustrated. I wrote my own software from scratch and actually beat them on getting something to work because it's easier to write something from scratch than figure out how to use ABS. And, yeah. Um, and then once we had this software, we actually had an SGI Onyx and an SGI Crimson Workstation rendering 24 hours a day for almost 12 days to produce an animation of this data. And this was, I mean, this was just, I mean, this was horrible. I mean, it was just, did not work, and this is not the way we wanted to operate. And I think, you know, part of the problem, too, with a lot of these tools is that, you know, maybe, maybe the people in, in, in Computer Center don't realize that, you know, in our division, we don't have a lot of these graphics workstations sitting around. I mean, the machines that we actually used were on loan to us at the time. And when they went away, I mean, what, we, what do we have in our group? We have a whole bunch of sons in our group. And we just don't, I mean, our sons just can't run that kind of software. We don't have the memory, we don't have the money to go buy machines for everything, everyone. So this is a real problem. Um, one way that we did get aware, around this, I should add, is we actually, we actually did write our own visualization program that generated, you know, generated this picture. And this visualization program was really primitive. It could only do two things. It could plot pixels, it could plot spheres, and it could let you rotate your data set with a mouse. And that's about it. Um, and that's certainly no way to do what I, I would claim it's no way to do real, you know, sort of interesting data analysis. As far as the performance, it wasn't very good either. I mean, this data set, this took 45 minutes to generate on an Onyx. This is about 11 million particles. Uh, this image is 38 million, 38 million fracture simulation. Uh, this took an Onyx three and a half hours to make that one picture. So you set it off and then you go to lunch and go watch a movie or something and then come back. So after all that, um, I mean, we really got to thinking about, you know, what's, what's wrong here? I mean, we're spending all our time trying to figure out how to make pictures and, you know, make the code run fast. And we're not, it just, it just seemed fundamentally the wrong direction. And we got to thinking about it. It just seemed like the whole problem here is just the whole way we went about doing this. I mean, the way that we were using the code at this, before we started this steering stuff is we would maybe spend a few days with a small problem just to kind of, you know, pick parameters and, see what would happen. And then we'd scale it up to something really big, run for a while, and then keep your fingers crossed that it actually did what you wanted it to do. And then after you run it, you would sit there and try to figure out what all the data files meant. And, you know, as part of this, I mean, one of the, one, another you know, big problem with this is just the whole, this whole decoupling of simulation and data analysis. I mean, when we're dumping these data files, I mean, we have incomplete data in the data files because you know, we have so much data that we have to pick a subset of it. And then if it happens to be that you dumped the wrong subset, you're sort of, I mean, you're kind of screwed. I mean, you have to rerun the simulation. And another problem is, you know, limited flexibility in the analysis tools. I mean, it's, it's always like, no matter what analysis tool you have, it doesn't have the analysis you want, no matter how sophisticated it is. And so that was a problem. And, and just this whole detachment from the simulation. I mean, we really wanted to be able to say, you know, do things like, well, let's implement this physical model for silicon or something. And now, and then go in and run a simulation and then get access to, you know, the parameters in the simulation to see what's happening, happening while this thing runs instead of having to try and figure it out in post-processing. And I think, you know, another thing that's probably, a, you know, I think it's a big influence on what we've been doing is just the users of our code. I mean, this code is very much a research code at this point. Uh, all the users of this system are writing code for it. Um, they're running simulations, you know, so a user might write code to set up an initial condition or a boundary condition and try to put it into the system. 
certainly our goal is to, I mean, our, our real goal is to do science, not computer science. I mean, it's sure, I mean, we have a lot of fun playing with the computers, but we really want to do the material science stuff. And I think from our previous experience, I mean, we really did not want some huge monolithic system. I mean, we wanted something that was a little bit, uh, a little bit, you know, loosely coupled and, you know, that we could modify and tweak and play with and things like that. And, and really, you know, the, 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 the one thing we wanted is we wanted to figure out some way to make working with these big simulations as simple as it was working with the small simulation. And, you know, when I came to the lab, or Los Alamos in 1990, you know, everyone I worked with was doing stuff in their office. I mean, they were doing data analysis and running simulations, and they were doing, you know, all this stuff from, from their office. And I would say that's really, you know, where, what, I mean, we had the right idea five years ago, and somehow when we went to these parallel machines, that just disappeared. I mean, it became too complicated to use the machines in your office. We had to go over to the computer center and use big SGIs and things like that. And that's really, I don't know. I mean, it, we really wanted to move it back into where we could sit, you know, where people in our group could sit in their office, work with big data sets, play around with simulations, and kind of get back to where we, where we were five years ago. So are there any, any questions on sort of our, the background? I mean, okay. <laughs> So steering uh, might be the latest buzzword. I, I don't know about that. Um, the basic idea is, at least as far as I understand it, is really what you're trying to do is combine simulation, data analysis, and visualization sort of all into one, one package. And at the same time, you're trying to provide the user with you know, some control and you know, a method for interacting with the code. So it, it, it really what we're doing is trying to break sort of this traditional cycle of doing the simulation and then doing the batch processing with some separate tool. I mean, don't get me wrong, we still do a lot of batch processing, but it turns out that we do, we can do both, we do both, both processing and the simulation with the same code, in our case. Um, I would claim it's not really a, a new idea. I mean, it sounds like, from what I understand, people, you, you've been doing that with the bases for, for years here in some, in some capacity. Um, you know, a lot of commercial packages take a lot of these ideas. And, you know, really the trick for us, I mean, admittedly this is a bias coming from you know the theoretical physics group is how to do this um, without making it too complicated because the users of our system really want to you know they want to tweak things and they want to play with code uh, and they don't want to you know try to figure out some really you know enormously complicated software system so um, so how to do this this is my most politically incorrect slide here um, we've gone to a lot of, at least in our group, we've gone to a lot of these supercomputing conferences. And at these supercomputing conferences, this, this is, you know, this may not be accurate, but this is our impression of steering at these conferences. Um, we've seen a lot of work with developing really sophisticated graphical user interfaces and, and visual programming. And, you know, you have to have this big software steering environment. And, you know, common examples, you know, some people have done steering with ABS and things like that. And just, we don't want anything to do with AVS, considering our prior experience. It could be the greatest thing in the world, and we're, I mean, we're, we're not sold on that. Uh, at the University of Utah, they've actually been developing a system called Ski Run. Um, ski Run for skiing in Utah. And it, it's sort of, it's a lot like AVS, but they've, at least they've fixed the memory problem, for one thing. But it's still sort of this, this graphical user interface idea. Um, another thing, you know, at these conferences, uh, they have the cave. Have, how many of you have been in that or seen that or heard about that? It is a big virtual reality room that they developed at Illinois and Minnesota. Um, you get in there and you look around at your data and it's, you know, apparently really cool. Um, maybe it's just me, but every, I mean, you know, one time I went in the cave, I thought it was completely confusing. And I, I don't know how I would deal, look at my data with that. Um, another thing is, you know, there's, there's certainly an emphasis on high performance graphics workstations. And that's great, except we don't have any in our group. Um, another thing that, that seems to be kind of, kind of popular right now is this high bandwidth networks. There was this thing at Supercomputing 95 to do the I-Way. Um, I forget what that stands for. Information, uh, I don't know. The idea is basically you get a bunch of machines, you hook them up with the, like OC3 or something, and then you're doing steering over remote networks and things like that. Uh, we actually had a demo in I-Way where we supposedly had a demo. Um, our demo of iWay, since the system didn't work at all, 
uh, basically consisted of playing an MPEG movie off an SGI workstation. That's not steering. I don't know what that is, but it's a huge waste of money as far as, our, as, far as we're concerned. Um, and, and there seems to be, you know, sort of this emphasis on you want maximum intera interactivity and instantaneous feedback. I mean, there's, there's certainly this crowd that wants you to be able to steer a scientific computation at 30 frames a second with your goggles on or something. And, you know, it's just, I don't know if that's necessary or not. So the problem we have with, you know, looking at this stuff at supercomputing and some of these other conferences is, you know, our problems that we're trying to deal with are already complicated. And, you know, from our perspective, doing this kind of stuff just makes it even more complicated. I mean, one of the things that we're trying to do is try to simplify things so we can understand it. And, you know, by making it go into virtual reality or, or whatever, I mean, it just seems like it makes it even more complicated than it was before. Um, such approaches, you know, are difficult to modify and extend. I mean, if you have a lot of software to do this kind of stuff, that, that's really bad for our users because they're modifying the code and they're adding new features and they, they don't want to have to deal with a really complicated software environment. The heck is that two listed twice here? And again, you know, the users of our code, we just don't have the resources to buy the, the equipment necessary to do this kind of thing. So what did we want in a, we got to thinking about this. I mean, we thought steering, that's, that's kind of a cool idea, you know, inter, you, know, you know, adding, you know, interactivity and analysis to our simulation. We like that. But, you know, what did we want in this system? You know, we're trying to use this for our own work. And we thought about it. And you know, some of the things that we wanted is we certainly wanted interactivity. We wanted the user to be able to interact with the code and, and do things. We also wanted scripting because you know, this, this code would run for 100 hours or so on these big machines. So you know, having the user sit there and interact with it the whole time, you know, that didn't seem necessary. We, we wanted memory efficiency because we're working with large simulations. And if, you know, if our steering software sucks up half our memory, then, the, then that sort of defeated the purpose of doing this in the first place. Uh, we wanted to have network efficiency. Um, we wanted this thing to work over standard internet connections and you know, not, not require these high-speed networks. Uh, we wanted it to work with our existing code, so we wanted, you know, wanted to be able to reuse most of our C code. Uh, we wanted the system to be extensible, you know, add new features and modules and things like that. Uh, we wanted to run on all machines. We didn't want just a dependence on graphics workstations. And it had to be easy to use. And the target machine that we wanted to have for this was a Spark One workstation. We figured if we could get something that would work, or something that a user could use from a Spark One workstation, then we would have something that would be, that would be useful to us. And you know, this may seem like a strange attitude, you know, this comment down at the bottom, but rather than having you know, this massive software environment for steering, we really felt that the one we would like the most would be one that you, that you didn't even notice you were using, sort of steering that's you know, that's, that's almost transparent to what you're, what you're trying to accomplish. So one of the ways, so the way that we, or at least the way we approach this, is we started playing around with scripting languages last year. And the idea was um, we would take our original molecular dynamics code, shown over here on the left, and what we would do is we would add sort of a scripting language to the front of it for controlling it. So the way that that worked is we would, we basically took our original application, put this, this new front end on it that was a, an interpreted language. And then once we had that, we started adding new modules. So we added some things to do data analysis, and we added to do some things to do visualization. Um, we added some networking code to send information back to a user's workstation. And kind of the idea was you would leave the original, you'd leave the original molecular dynamics code about the same, and then you would just add this new stuff to it. So we could reuse most of our, most of our old, old stuff. So the way the user controls this is they can type commands. I mean, if you've used MATLAB or Mathematica or something like that, that that's the model that we had in mind. You could type commands and do things. And you can also control this with scripts. So we could script batch jobs and things like that. Now, some of the advantages of, of this approach um, and it's interpreted and it's interactive. I mean, even though it's text interface, you can do a lot with that. Uh, it supports batch processing, which we wanted. Uh, scripting languages are extremely memory efficient. Um, using this kind of thing is very extensible. I mean, scripting languages make great glue languages for gluing together modules and different commands and things like that. Um, most of these languages are pretty, are highly portable. Um, 
Uh, we could do rapid prototyping, debugging. And you know, some of the, one of the advantages of using these scripting languages, at least common ones like TCL and Python and things like that, is they're free and they're usually well supported because they're, they're used in, you know, widely in the Unix community and, and for other things besides scientific computing. The only catch to using a scripting language is, is how do you, okay, you know, it's fine to say let's control my, my C program or my Fortran program with a scripting language. How do I add functions to it? I mean, how do I let this thing access my C function? And the problem is that turns out to be somewhat, somewhat messy and, and error prone. And to give you an idea of that, um, Let's say I want to access this function. This is a function from our MD code called FCC block. It creates a FCC lattice, of, a crystal lattice. If I want to add that function or access that function from something like Python, I have to write all this code on the right. Which, you know, I don't know. I mean, the code isn't on the right isn't that complicated. But we had about 200 functions in our, our application. And having to write that stuff on the right 200 times, you know, I don't know. That didn't seem too attractive. So, needless to say, this is kind of a this is kind of a pain if you have to write this a lot. And all of these other scripting languages are the same way. I mean, if you want to add add your function to TCL, you have to do something similar. So, we've written this this program, or I've written this tool called SWIG, which stands for Simplified Wrapper and Interface Generator. Uh, really, I just needed an acronym that would fit in well going to the University of Utah and, you know, get the department kind of kind of riled up a little bit. Uh, basically, what this, what this tool does is we take uh, ANSI C declarations and we produce all that wrapper code automatically. So what's cool about this, you know, for, for our molecular dynamics code, is like this file over on the right, the user, these are just ordinary C functions in the code. The user just lists what functions they want. And then at compile time, this automatically gets transformed into everything you need to use this within Python or another scripting language. So, so the way that this works is, you know, if a user wants to add some initial condition or something to this, to this program, they could write it as a C function. Then they could just list the name of the function in this file. And then when this program is recompiled, this automatically appears to them in the user interface. Um, you know, this talk isn't so much about, about this tool, but, you know, some of the things about it, it actually supports almost all C data types, including pointers and, and things like that. Um, it's language independent. This, this file here can actually be used to produce TCL, Perl, Python, and, and some other, you know, target language code. Uh, it does work with existing C code really well. So one of the things that we've been using, sort of the, our general philosophy on using this approach is, or at least with using SWIG, is that rather than building some huge monolithic system and, and trying to force everyone to use it, um, we kind of feel that you know, we'll, let the, we'll, you know, we'll provide enough support you know, to do common things, but otherwise let the user just do whatever they want, sort of a free-for-all, uh, which may not work all the time. but. Uh, SWIG lets us do that, because I mean, we have language independence, so if somebody doesn't like Python or something like that, they can use some other scripting language to control this thing. Um, users can write their own modules for this system. Um, we, we would really like to use existing libraries, like graphics libraries and data analysis libraries. Uh, we've been able to use commercial packages. Like, we can actually, like one of the things I'll show later, is actually able to turn MATLAB into a module for SPASM. And we really feel that, you know, it's important to provide sort of just primitives and not really solutions. I mean, we're trying to let, you know, have something that the user can build whatever they want um, without having to go through a lot of headings. So one of the things I'm going to show is just sort of, I'm going to show four different examples of sort of different types of spasm applications that I've been able to build using SWIG and some of, the, some of this approach that we've been doing. Um, so the first example is I'm going to show where we've taken the molecular dynamics code and actually combined it with a parallel graphics and data analysis module that I wrote last year. Um, it's actually possible to run SPASM from within a Perl interpreter. Uh, we have a version of code, all these are pretty experimental, by the way, that runs with uh, MATLAB and TCLTK. And it turns out that you can run the code with no scripting language at all, which is sort of a minimalistic version. And kind of the interesting thing is all four of these use exactly the same C source code. So let's go through some of these examples. Um, the parallel version, 
consists of, well, it consists of the spasm code, uh, has a parallel 8-bit graphics module that we wrote. Uh, this graphics module, this is pretty bare bones, but we designed something that would be extremely memory efficient and work on the parallel machines for us. Uh, it does some data analysis, and right now this uses my own scripting language. Um, nothing seems to work right on parallel machines, and at the time I was doing this, it just, I don't know, I'd, I'd gotten interested in scripting languages, I thought it'd be cool to write my own. And so it's sort of a combination of things. It'd be cool to write my own, and it would, I could make something that would work on the parallel machines. Um, we're in the process of converting this over to Python at the moment, but this is what we use for now. Uh, this system is what we're using for big production simulations on the CM5 and T3D. Um, the system handles 100 million particle data sets, and like this picture on the, this picture on the right is actually an image generated by that system. Uh, the image up there is 104 million particles, and it took about 15 to 30 seconds to make, generate, display remote. Uh, the way that we do the display is we actually produce GIF images in the simulation code itself and just send them to the workstation across the network. So, so that's one example. Um, kind of another interesting thing that I've been playing with is, you know, you could build Spasm as a Perl module for Perl 5. And why would you want to do this? I mean, this sound, might sound just completely insane at first. Um, we actually do a fair amount of sharing of data with other divisions, and particularly other, other divisions sort of in the theory division with people who are developing potentials. For, for materials. I mean, we're very interested in potentials for, for molecular dynamics. And lots of times they give us these really weird data formats. You know, they'll say, well, here's my potential for this, you know, for copper or something, but it's in this file that, that might have some weird format. Or they might give us an initial condition that's in some strange format. Um, by having this in Perl, it actually turns out to be really easy just to write little scripts, we can actually read, you know, odd formats and things and play, put, put them directly into our simulation code. And, you know, it sounds kind of weird, but, you know, we already have a lot of, like, awk scripts and things sitting around. So this is just sort of, this is like an extended awk script that we can use to just, just read a weird input file and put it directly into our simulation code. And, you know, I think this is kind of neat because, you know, previously I'd always have to write some C function or something to go read their weird input file. And now I don't have to do that anymore. Uh, sort of another example, uh, this is a screenshot from something I did a couple months ago. Um, it actually has the spasm code, um, MATLAB, so a data analysis tool, and a TCLTK, a very simple graphical user interface on it. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting that you can combine, you know, I mean, stuck like an entire commercial package into this thing. Uh, this is actually running on a workstation. So this is really, this is more geared towards like debugging, you know. Maybe I'm just trying to develop some new physical model and I want to be able to plot things and, and look at data and, and see what's going on. And this is one way that we can do that. And then finally we sort of have the minimalistic version. Uh, it turns out if you don't like scripting languages, you have some fear or, or, or whatever, uh, you can just write a main program and call function. We have a whole library of stuff that's prefixed by the word spasm. So this, there's a whole bunch of, I don't know, probably doesn't make much sense. But, but you know, some of the users of the code actually prefer this. I mean, we, we have a couple guys that just, you know, they don't like this steering idea whatsoever. And, you know, that, that's fine, you know, and it, but, it, but I think it's really valuable for us to be able to, you know, if they develop some new, new for, you know, new additions to this code, we'd like to be able to use it in some of our data analysis stuff. And, you know, they'd like to be able to use some of the stuff that we have without, you know, necessarily requiring, you know, a scripting language. And, and certainly from, you know, our point of view, we feel that, you know, the interface may change with time, but we really want to be able to reuse a lot of the science that we put into this code in terms of physical models and stuff. So at this point, um, I'm going to attempt to do a demo. Um, I'm always skeptical when I give demos because I never... There's always that chance that they're going to crash. But um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to remotely run um, the spasm code at the advanced computing lab at Los Alamos. And one of the things I'm going to do is do some post-processing of a 35 million atom simulation of copper that we did on a Cray T3D. Um, each data file in this thing is 700 megabytes. Um, all the analysis and visualization is done remotely. So nothing is being done on this workstation here. 
Um, the only thing that's being done here is, is local display of, of results. And this is sort of the, current, the simulation we're currently using for, for big simulation. And then I'm going to show some other stuff that we're, that we're working on. Yeah let's, let, yeah, let's do that. One of, one of the, it looks like one of the ways you solve the, the problem of banging a whole bunch of data down to a workstation, you should do it on the mainframe where you've got all the capacity, you've got all the memory. How did you solve the, the problem that you listed up there where the user says, oops, uh, I didn't exactly tell the computer to, to, to process or render what I wanted, and now I've got to go and rerun the simulation. Can you deal with that at all? This is a uh, we actually run on the parallel machines interactively. Um, in terms of, I mean, uh, you'll see that in a second, but it's um, when you log into like a big connection machine. I mean, are, are you talking about running the simulation or actually like post processing or? The, when, when you run it and you're doing, you're doing concurrent, you're doing concurrent processing, right, of the, of the information as the simulation runs. So I watch that, then I then okay, then I can steer and say, oh, I missed this stop, <coughs> or, I can, or I can interactively change the plot parameters so now it is going to generate the data that I want instead of the data that I asked for. Um, well, how do I want to answer that? Um, what we can do is we can, we, you can start up a simulation and you can have it produce information in real time as far as plots and stuff. Um, in terms of actually being able to like change, a, we, we, we can change certain parameters, like maybe if we're pulling something apart that we have a certain strain rate, we might be able to decrease, we can decrease the strain rate during a simulation. Um, for the types of stuff we do, usually if a simulation starts to go awry, there's no way to recover it because, I mean, it's the dynamics of the simulation. We'll have to start over. Um, one of the things that we do get with, this, with the steering stuff is being able to actually diagnose things, diagnose things as it runs and maybe determine that something is wrong at an earlier time instead of having to have this thing run for so long and then find out it's screwed up. We can find out that, you know, that something is going wrong much sooner and have to restart it. The point is that which plot you make is not pre can You can... So we can, we can, yeah, you can suddenly decide to plot something right. that you hadn't planned to write. Yeah. Right. I mean, the, the data, I mean, yeah, I mean, there is, there is a certain element of steering, which maybe I wasn't, didn't plan to comment on, but th there's certainly, a, you know, a group that feels that, you know, steering, one, one of the things you can do is you just make arbitrary changes to your simulation parameters as you run something. And we actually personally feel that that's kind of dangerous because when we're doing these scientific runs, one of the, you know one of the things you want is is control, right? I mean, you want you want to have precise control and, and records of what you did during the simulation, and just arbitrarily changing things in the middle of a run. I, I don't know how you would explain that to your coworker, you know, when you when you show them the results of the simulation and say, oh, by the way, well, I I changed this and I changed that and I changed this in the middle of this run. I mean, well, what does that mean? So we don't tend to make lots of changes to the actual simulation data when we run things. But we do, we do, we can change things like what we're looking at, what data, you know, show me this, and then maybe halfway through the run we can say, well, you know, let's take a look at this data and, and things like that. You can't back up and say, I missed something, I want to look at a different quantity a um, hundred times back and start back from there. If, if we dump data files to disk, we can go back and look at that. So, you know, one of the things that we do, you know, run will progress and it will continue, it will dump data files to disk. And then if you, if you're, if somewhere back, the, you know, back in the simulation you want to look at something else, you'll have to load one of those data files and, and look at it. So if you, if you just run this without dumping any data files, well, then you have to rerun it. So. Are these data yeah. files be used as restart files? Uh, some of them can. Yeah. We actually have two, two kinds of files in our code. We have checkpoint files, which contain all of the simulation data, and we have sort of smaller dump files, which contain partial information. And the main reason for that is these checkpoint files are, are all double precision, all quantities, and tend to be rather large. I mean, a single checkpoint file could be five gigabytes or something. And when we have a graphics package will analyze both. Graphic will analyze both checkpoint files and the smaller dump files. Yeah, there's a uh, I just wanted to be clear what uh, steering and your scripting uh, encompasses. Uh, 
Well, the whole system, it's all, it's all one system, and it's all controlled by a scripting language. So, I mean, it's a little bit, there is no graphics package. The graphics package is the simulation package. I mean, everything is the simulation package. It's, it's, I mean, it may sound strange, but it's all combined. I mean, it's, we have one code that runs simulation. At the same time, that code can do graphics. And so the whole thing is, the whole thing is controlled by a scripting language. So if you're, if you're in the middle of a simulation, you can say, well, let's run for a while. And then if, 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 it's, if you stop it, I mean, you know, maybe the simulation will run for a while and stop. You can just say, well, make a plot of that. And you can do that without even leaving the code, because it's all the same code. And, and that's sort of, that's how I sort of see steering. I mean, it, one of the problems that we had is by having all these sort of decoupled graphics packages and simulation, we sort of gave ourselves a lot of headache. So what we've done is we've just said, well, it's just all the same code. I mean, it's, it's the spasm code. If you want to do post-processing, you run spasm. If you want to run a simulation, you run spasm. I mean, it's the same code and it has, and, and you know, and sort of, that gives a, a lot of capabilities because in our sort of graphics code, what we can do is we can go in and actually use physical, you know, like maybe the physical models and, you know, and some of the, the physics that's built, built into the simulation code. And, you know, that, that's really what we're trying to, trying to get. Adds the, the command interface to your codes. Right. Swig is just a, a tool that you give it a list of C functions and it adds it to the scripting language so you can access them. If you're adding a new physics module that has completely new parameters and you want to look at, you have to be familiar with graphics packages. Somewhere in there you have graphics packages there. Do you have to know about those graphic packages and how they work to add a whole new module? Um, not really. Our goal is to make it so you don't have to know that at all if you don't want to. Everybody's goal. Everybody's goal. In, 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 the, in the current system, you don't need to know, unless, unless you want to look at something really weird. I mean, if you want to go in and plot well, some. If you want to look at your, your parameters that are used in the code. Then you would have to do something. But I'm going to talk about that. We're, we're working on some, some techniques to get around that. Where is the power switch here? OK. Does it give you access to the variables in your code or just the functions? Both. Both. Okay. And I have a few follow-up slides at the end here. But Oh, OK, so we are. So I guess the first thing, I'll actually show a couple things to address some of the, some of the questions. Uh, the first thing I'm going to show is, assuming that I can get onto the machine, Uh, this is the Cray T3D at Los Alamos. Um, I'm on a 32 processor partition right now. Um, what's going on here is um, is uh, this machine here is actually running a special process that we call, it's just a server, a really original name. Um, uh, what it is, it's a program that sits on this workstation and is going to um, It's going to listen for image data because one of, one of the things that we do is uh, the way our code works is that the, the parallel code actually produces these GIF files. And in order to get the network time down, we actually send the GIF file directly to a workstation through a socket connection. So we're not using X, X windows or anything like that. We're just trying to, we're trying to just ship a GIF file across the network and hopefully save us a little bit of network time. So on one of these windows, the, this server has already been started on this, on this machine. And I need to do something. They changed our operating system on this machine, which screwed me up horribly. Well, one of the reasons I, I should say for shipping these uh, GIF images directly across the network is it, it turns out that when I'm at the University of Utah, um, our network bandwidth has gotten so bad that we only get maybe 800 bytes a second during the day. So um, I've had a certain incentive to try and reduce the amount of stuff we, s we send across the network. So at this point, um, this, is the, this is the spasm code running. Um, when we start it up, all we get is a prompt if we start it up interactively. 
And this prompt is really, this is our scripting language. So some of the things that we can do is, um, this is just a, a test initial condition, assuming I can read the keyboard. I uh, set up an initial condition, doesn't say much, because not much happened. Uh, we can run scripts. This is a script to set up some of the graphics. You can't see the keyboard. Um, and so some of the things that we can do is maybe set up an initial condition um, and see what it looks like. So this is just a, this is a bare initial condition. Um, once we have it up, we can do things like, you know, we can, we can manipulate that, take a look at it. Uh, do things like, I mean, we can do, you know, look at images sort of in the same way that we had the, the other system, or some of the, at the SGI pictures that we had. And so you can so you can take a look. So, one, so the, sort of the first thing you can take a look at your initial condition, um, which for us is really useful because trying to set this stuff up sometimes is really complicated. Now, once you have this, um, so what do the, colors mean? the colors are actually representing kinetic energy in this in this image. Uh, we can go and look at other quantities like potential energy and velocities and things like that, but I, I don't want to do that right now. For example, you see potential energy and kinetic energy at the same time. And uh -huh. um, I, I'm not going to do that. I'll show you that in a, in a little bit. Um, so one of the things that we can do is, since this is our simulation code, I mean, sure, we set up an initial condition and we visualized it. Um, we can actually just run the simulation right now because it's all the same code. So I've given it a command. and. The, the machine is actually now running this simulation. And assuming it works, it'll even update the image in real time as, as the simulation runs. So what's happening is this, this is just a small plate that's being pulled apart. With a, with a, it has a defect in it. And the, the color cycling, the, this display is actually done with XV. Um, this is a very minimalistic graphics approach here. Um, and the, the weird color is what XV does when it gets a new image. So. This is done every time this, this is doing going every 10 times steps right now. So um, that just ran 100 time steps on the, on the Cray. So sort of, in, sort of in this application, I mean, this is really useful for us because we can, we can you know, work. This is a very small simulation. Only, it's only like 23,000 atoms. We can sit there and play around and, you know, and see you know, maybe our numerical method is unstable or something. And, and we can see that, and we can watch it happen, and we can try and debug things. Well, how do you solve your bandwidth problem? Do you have a lot of data? Are these GIF files compressed? Well, the GIF is actually compressed image format. Um, this is actually, this, this window actually shows the size of files coming across the network. Uh, 25,000 bytes, 26,000 bytes. So I mean, even though this data set internally in the machine is, is much larger, the GIF files are actually pretty small. I mean, they're about 20, 20, 30K coming across. The T3D at this moment is, is burning my money. Um, so uh, you don't necessarily want to do this on, like, 256 processors if you're paying for it. The uh, system will work on two processors. Uh, actually, the same system runs on a workstation, which I actually prefer because uh, running on the parallel machines is sort of a pain. I mean, there's a whole group of people talking about parallel tools and dedicated to that. I've actually found it's easier just to do code development on my son, in which case the same system works. Um, it's just a little slower. So you don't have to necessarily burn, burn your money if you're Uh, 
Um, so that's one application of the code. Um, what we, what's really more useful is, is dealing with the stuff that we can't do on our workstation. Um, so I'm going to restart it again. How come the picture's still there? Well, the picture is, um, running, is, a, is a server running on this machine. So it, it turns out that the, the, the server will stay up even if you run the code multiple times on the, on the parallel machine. So, so our idea is maybe we can leave an image up all the time or you know, put it in the background and the, you know, the code will, we can run multiple, multiple runs and things like that. So this is, a, this is a little bit larger. This is post-processing um, from a run that we ran for about 120 hours a couple months ago. And right now this is reading, it's reading 34,960,000 atoms off, off the disk array. Which takes a second. This is about a 700 megabyte data file. And you know, being a, you know one of the, one of the things that's no well, okay, so we got it. Um, one of the reasons why it's important for us to be able to do this on the on the parallel machine is it, it turns out that I really can't transfer 700 megabytes of data between Los Alamos and school, at least not in my lifetime on, at our current network connection speed. So. So one of the things we can do is load these big data sets. up on the parallel machine and then take a look at them. So this is what, you know, what we get if we just start this up native. We've got a big block. What we've done is we put an elliptical hole in the thing and <coughs> we've pulled this thing apart a little bit. And what we're trying to do in this simulation is look for dislocation loops. So one of the problems that we have, let me move this window down a little bit, is how do you find things like dislocations in that, that block of material? I mean, we can, we can certainly do things like manipulate the data set. We could rotate it around and, and you know, try to get different angles. Let me get rid of this. Uh, but that doesn't really tell us too much. Um, which I just type a, a bad command into text V there. As far as the times, I mean, you know, to, even though this is taking about 15 to you know, 20 seconds to create these images, this was taking us three and a half hours on our SGI. So uh, we're, we're willing to you know, wait that kind of time to. And now I, I seem to have rotated this. Okay, we're back to normal. <laughs> So, you know, some of the things that we've done is, um, I don't want is to, it, is it turns out that this, um, this bar across the bottom of the image, we can actually look at histograms of, like, data values. And we can do things like put that on logarithmic scales and, 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 and try to play around and, and be able to find, you know, find different things in our data. This will take a second to come up. So I put that on a logarithmic scale. And it turns out for finding dislocations, one of the things we found out that we can do is, in, at least in materials, we can look at like slight deviations in potential energy. Because if, you know, if, a, if, a, if an atom has been dis, you know, as out, of, out, of a, you know, out of alignment with respect to its neighbors, it causes some you know, discrepancy in the, in the potential energy or its, or its contribution to the total potential energy. And so one of the things that we can do is, um, It turns out that these images are, are coded. They actually have a scale on them. Um, um, get up here. It turns out that like this, this lower or this lower left-hand point is zero, and this upper point up here is coded as one as 100. So what we can do is we can say we can look at this you know zero to 100 scale and say well chop off all the data. We can give it units like that. We can say chop off all the data from say 16 up to 100. And show me, you know, or, or show, you know, show me what all that data is. 
And so it sort of, there's, you know, there's a lot of stuff encoded in these images to help us out in terms of navigation. Uh, we can also, if we wanted to move the image left or right, um, it's also on this zero to 100 scale. So we can move the thing up. If we move it up 50, it will move up half a screen. If we move it right 50, it will move right half a screen. You might see some of that in a, in a second. So what this command I just gave it is I'm actually chopping off some of the data um, in order to try and find dislocations in this, in this block or try to find atoms that have been sort of dislodged from their equilibrium position. So if we do that, now we start to see things in, in the interior of this, of this data. Um, I can do other things. So I can clip off the, um, the, these two things on these, we have free surfaces. I can actually clip those off because they sort of get in the way of looking what's happening in, in the interior of this blog. Does the coding for the analysis essentially something you and your colleagues have developed or is it using a commercial package? Um, this code is something that we've developed. And how many ban years or man months? Um, this took, it took uh, basically me about a month to write, to write this. It's only about, the whole data analysis for this is maybe 4,000 lines of C code at this point. I thought you were trying to avoid that by saying you weren't a computer scientist, you were a scientist. <laughs> what? And you wanted to use, I thought you were trying to avoid writing your own. Well, well, part of it is we gave up on the computer center doing it for us. Um, we, would like to use, we would like to use more commercial stuff if we could. Uh, part of the problem is there isn't much incentive for people to, to port commercial software to the Cray T3D, as far as I can what tell. So. These graduates and go off <laughs> to your graduate. They're going to let me graduate? Um, uh, hopefully, they'll be able to modify it. I think that's what we really want to want to shoot for. Um, colors in this case are actually potential energy. We've, um, I mean, this has been set up to plot something different. So some of the things we can go in and, you know, we can look at, you know, these are, dislo these are actually dislocation loops that have been emitted from this, this crap front, and we can, we can go in and, and zoom in on them. And uh, cut away data and, and do other things. Now, one of the interesting things um, when we developed this is um, that, that's, that's actually happened since is it turns out that a lot of the, the features that we're interested in, in these simulations is actually only a small percentage of the, the total simulation data. Uh, and one of the things that we can do with this system is maybe, maybe we can take the data that we see here and we can actually dump that out to a new data file. And when you do that, it turns out that the data file you get, I mean, it goes from like 700 megabytes down to maybe 20 megabytes. And that 20, 20 megabyte file, you can load on an SGI. And you can actually use some of these tools like Explorer and AVS and things like that. And it works great. Um, so even though those systems can't handle these really big data sets, it turns out that what we can do with this system is you can find interesting things to look at, dump a new data file, and then go to those machines and use that kind of stuff if we really want to. So are there any, any other questions on this? I mean, I can continue to, I mean, we can continue to play around with this. You can cut away data and, and, and look at things in, in this data set. Your users use this control language you're using? Right, right now, yeah. And they don't have much trouble? Um, not that I know of. I, I, will, I do want to talk about that, though, because there, is, there has been a general confusion about what happens to a code when you put a scripting language on it. And, and part of the confusion is, um, in, in sort of our older application, it was well understood what you had to do in order to do a simulation. It was sort of a predefined step. You know, you had to initialize memory, you had to set up initial condition, and then you had to run for a while. Or, you know, or maybe set up a few other things. And what's happened when, we, when we've gone to the steering approach, it turns out that this whole sort of linear approach to things has gone completely out the window. And it turns out that some of the, and, and in fact, some of the users are, are it's, it's been kind of confusing to know what to do necessarily to start a, to run a simulation. Because there isn't necessarily a predefined order anymore. 
mean, a lot of this stuff can be done completely out of order at any time, and, and, and you know, that has been confusing, and I, I don't really know an answer to that other than... I mean, your users, what, writing Python to do this, or they just get a simple s bunch of scripts from you and, <laughs> and throw that command at us, or what? They've been writing all their own scripts at this point. I mean, they, they understand the control language, and part of, you know, this is actually my own scripting language right now, which is extremely limited. So there isn't, there isn't a whole lot that they need to know at, at this point. I mean, they know they can write scripts and they, and they can run simulations. Doesn't this actually make it more complicated? You're adding another level of complexity. Now you have to know C and, and physics. And now you have to know at least one scripting language, not more, and perhaps a graphics language. Or more. Right. So remember, you were talking about adding less complicated. Well, I mean, I, I think from our standpoint, this is actually not complicated because, you know, the scripting language is actually, you know, all these commands that I'm typing in the scripting language are actually C functions. And many of them are actually written by the user himself or herself. I mean, it's something, if you write a command, it, you know, a C function, it shows up in the scripting language. So really what you're doing, I mean, it's just you're controlling your C program and, you know, at a very low level. I mean, if you've written a function to set up an initial condition, you type that function name with, it, with the parameter. I mean, one if we thought about it, um, the problem is we don't want to run GUI off the Cray or the connection machine. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for it. One is, uh, it's, in order to do that, we'd have to link in some of the X11 libraries on, the, on, the, on that machine itself. Um, we might be able to, yeah, we've thought about that too. Um, I mean, I, I guess for us, we haven't really considered having a GUI to be that important. People have asked you know. me often uh, about GUI front ends for basis, and I keep asking them what's on the button. Uh, as soon as you can tell me what the buttons say, I'll write it. But uh, so far, I've, I've concluded that the programming <coughs> language is, is the essence of what's going on. You could have a few buttons for convenience, but the, the ability to control the simulation with the scripting language is, is the guts of what's going on. I also don't understand the remark about it being more complicated. If you're going to have any graphics, somebody has to learn the graphics package. Um, uh, somebody has to learn commands like plot y comma x. If, if, I, I don't, there's some sort of conservation of difficulty there. Uh, I think well, with these systems, you've got it down to plot y comma x. Surely that's simple enough. That or you can you can have a button that says plot and then another the field comes up and says plot what? You don't need to remember that. I mean, you can do things like that. You've got lots of time. I mean, well, after, after <laughs> <that> plot, <laughs> why not? The other point is though, is you have to have this so that it'll work without you. Yeah, I don't know how many times I've learned a graphics package that runs with the code and then find out when they switch to a new machine, the graphics package that I learned no longer works and you have to learn a new graphics package. You know, it's obvious to someone who already knows the graphics package how it works and just picking it up for the first time. Well, so think, right. right. So your point is you want a generic interface to the graphics yeah. package. And that's what we're all talking about. Suppose there is one. In our, in our work with Python so far, we have the same interface so far in two different graphics packages. But it's the same interface from the user's point of view. Right. I think that's what we are starting to do. Do you have some right. kind of help that you can list like that. functions that are available? Um, yeah, there isn't much in terms of documentation. Um, well, I mean, there is not, not online so documentation. Just forget a spelling of it, you know, or capitalization of something. Yeah, what, what we have in the code right now, it's like, let's say you want all commands to start with the letter R, you just type R, and it'll actually tell you all the commands that you can type. And it gives the format. Good. What? And it gives the format. And it tells you what the arguments are and all that. And it stuff. prints out all the variables, too, that are... Uh -huh. Well, we can't no, remember. Uh, eventually, what I'd like to have is we've, we've been talking about having some sort of man command um, or, you know, some sort of, you know, documentation command. And it turns out that the, that the SWIG program will in turn see comments. If you put them in these specification files, we'll turn those into documentation. Um, so what we'd like to have is actually the modules themselves will produce documentation automatically for the, for the user. Are you going to say anything about C++? Um, <laughs> C++. Uh, we're not using it in our code. Um, we're, I, I, I can tell you the reasons why. One is we're con very concerned about the performance of C++. Um, there has been some stuff in the literature um, 
indicating that the performance is not necessarily that great. Now, maybe that's just depends on how you use it, which is what I feel. Um, the other problem is a lot of the users in our, that are using this code, I think, don't really, they don't know C++, and there's a certain reluctance to, to use it at this point. That's for I mean, spasm. That's for spasm. But for SWIG in general, are you going to push that into C++? SWIG will do some C++. It can handle classes and, and inheritance and some things like that. Fortran. Fortran. Um, <laughs> we don't we don't do anything with Fortran right now because all the, all of the code we've written is is, is ANSI C, and I mean that's just I mean we just there's we haven't had an incentive to do Fortran at this point. I think it would be interesting to to try and do some of that. But uh, one of the things that we, while while we have the demo up, it's I would I actually should, I should say that for Python there is a, a guy who's done there's something a, almost identical to Swift for Fortran. Is that out now? Is that um, he's he's trying to get it released from the employer. He quit. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but it isn't. It's so simple. I I think I could duplicate it in two days if I had to. So. Um, one of the things, that, like I mentioned earlier, we have been actually we have been converting the, our code over to Python. Um, I do have a, a super experimental version of it, um, to just to give you a flavor of what we're kind of shooting for with Python and what we can do. Um, this is actually spasm. I don't know, maybe I need to move that up a little bit. Uh, this, this is uh, running, we just got an UltraSpark multiprocessor server in our group, and that's what this is running on. So this is not, this is not, a, not a Cray at this point. Um, I think it looks like, type the, I'm in the wrong directory here. Um, so um, this is the code. I mean, it actually comes up. It's, it's actually running Python, although if you look at it, um, I mean, I have the Cray one down here. Um, it doesn't look a whole lot different from our, our current system. I mean, the prompt is the same, and a lot of the commands are the same. Um, some of the things that we can do in this system, um, let me. I mean, we can write scripts. Um, I actually have that, I, this is a simple thing to set up like a shockwave, and I actually have a slide of that. Just so you can see what, I mean, what, what these scripts actually might look like. Um, it's really simple, so that, that's, just a, that's just a script to set up an initial condition for this, for this talk. And it looks a lot like C code, actually. I mean, a lot of, this stu these are, a lot of these are just C functions that are in our code. So that's what that's what that script looks like. So that's, a Python script. that's a Python script, a simple one. So I run that, and um, and so what we've been doing is we've actually been, um, or I've been playing with. Um, trying to make the, some of the data analysis stuff more flexible and being able to do um, new kinds of things. So, so we can do some of the same things we did before. We can produce images of, um, of data sets and, and rotate them. Go take a closer look. So this, what we've done is, is we've made a, a huge t a tube of material, and then we've set up sort of a, a high velocity region on one end. I don't know if I mean th I, this is very. The simulation probably isn't even that great, but mainly meant to show some of the things that we're shooting for. So we can we can move that around. And then we can run the simulation like we did before. So this is going to run for a few times down. So the code is talking down a socket to this graphic server and sending it GIF files. Right. 
And who's writing the GIF file on the other end? Just the, the Spasm code itself. I mean, you right. learned how to write GIF, or did you use some library? Or? Um, I stole it out of some package. But I didn't feel so bad because I stole it out of some other package themselves. So. <laughs> It, and, and I think it all. I think if you go find some GIF code somewhere, you'll find that it all got stolen out of the Unix compress command at some point. Because um, <laughs> what they've done, what GIF actually is, it's LZW compression of, of data files at, at, at its low level. So you know, some of the things that we can do with the new system is, you know, you know, we can do a lot of the stuff that we that we did before. So we can look at you know look at new data sets after we've run a while. Um, some of the things that we that we what, what we're trying to do now is um, actually generate X Y plots. I mean, sure we can you know plot the atoms, but you know this is sort of a shock wave problem. One of the things we might want to know is you know what does the velocity profile look like across across that material. And if I can remember what the command was. Um, we can generate XY plots on the fly as well. So this is, uh, I mean, an XY plot showing sort of the, the, the Z component of velocity along this, and the velocity component along this, along this block. And one of the things that we really like about, at least we like about Python, is that we can actually create functions and do things do things right on the on the fly. I mean, while running this simulation, so one of the things that I could do is, you know, maybe I could just write a command to maybe run the simulation and update both of those images as it runs. So just just give you an idea of what a I mean, what a Python. Oh, about an afternoon. And so, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do is actually make use of, um, you know, like Python's object-oriented features. Um, turns out that each one of these images is just an each object. And we can manipulate them in a uniform way. I mean, we have, there's like a show command. So if we want to show any one of those, I just type image.show. And it doesn't matter what it is. It can be an XY plot or a 3D plot or, or things like that. So, you know, some of the things that we can do is, you know, we can run. You know, we can run simulations. We can update plots in real time. We can watch this stuff happen at, as this thing runs. Could you change your variables on the fly? Like Say plot square root of velocity or something? Um, we can't do that right now. But then again, I only had this working about three days ago. So eventually we would like to have that. We, we would like to have something comparable to what you might see in something like MATLAB or, or IDL or, or some of these tools. And for, for use on workstations, we've actually thought about maybe even trying to use those tools directly. I mean, at this point, this is just a, a prototype system just to try and get the user interface worked out and some other thing. You mentioned you're using Tickle to control MATLAB to directly interact with the spasm, right? Mm -hmm. So couldn't you, by that means, <coughs> you, you know, somebody wanted to plot square root of velocity, can you fairly easily do that? Uh, I th yeah, I think you, should, you could do that. I mean, one of the, one of the problems for us is with, with respect to MATLAB is um, it doesn't run on the Cray T3D, or at least we're not aware that it does. So we, we sort of have a, a certain emphasis in trying to have some stuff that's going to work on the parallel machines and our workstation. But I think and in terms of, of the numerical capabilities, the, uh, the numerical package in Python itself is, is just as good as MATLAB. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so our plans are to have it running in both places, to, to have the actual interpretive engine on the T3D as well as uh, in a workstation environment. I mean, I think one of the things that we'd really like to have is, you know, by going to Python, what we can do is we can abstract a lot of the underlying details of how these plots get generated. And I think Paul talked about this. Um, I mean, we, we think that it should be possible to maybe even switch whatever the rendering engine is underneath 
without changing the user interface because we've sort of built this at a very high level. Um, it turns out that, 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 that this data analysis code that you're seeing now is almost written entirely in Python. Um, the only thing that's written in C at this point is we have some low-level primitives to go through and plot all the particles because that takes a lot of computational power. And we have some functions to manage the frame, like a frame buffer, draw lines and plot points and, and do things like that. But the, the overall organization of this, I mean, it, everything all the way down to the tick marks and the labeling is all written in Python. And so if we swap out the, the underlying code to produce the images, I mean, we would really like to be able to, you know, maybe, maybe you could bring in MATLAB or something like that underneath and yet not have the user interface change at the high level. So, you know, some of the other things, um, how am I doing on time? Um, I mean, with the system, I mean, we can actually create new image types on the fly. I mean, we can create classes of, of new images. Um, I don't know, do I want to type in one right now? <laughs> Is there any interest in seeing, seeing like a new, intro, new, new image created on the fly? I can do it one that's scripted, but. Sure, okay. I mean, I mean, if there is an interest in Python, I mean, it can show how this kind of works. Um, you know, in this, in this in, you know, with Python, it's, I mean, it's really easy to create um, new kinds of things. I mean, even interactively while running a simulation. Um, so what I'm gonna do is create a new image that plots total energy as the simulation runs. And Personally, I think doing this is, I mean, it's a whole lot easier than using something like C++, I mean, in terms of doing object-oriented programming. So, write a few functions here. I don't want to go into all the details of what this is, but... So some of these commands that I'm typing, like this thing plot, uh, it looks like I made a typo already. Um, well, I'll type it in. I have this as a, as a script anyway. So, um, so some of these commands, I mean, we're actually creating a class. It's sort of a mixture of C functions and, and Python functions. Um, so the way that I'm going to define my plot is I want, to, I want to graph energy. So there's a C function to calculate the energy, so I'll call that. Um, if I want to get the time, I mean, we want to plot energy versus time. Um, turns out that that um, that thing actually acts as this, this total time is actually a C variable. It's a C global variable inside the code. And to access that, we just type C var dot, and it goes and gets it. And the same with total energy, we can get variables out. I guess it's a good thing I have this scripted somewhere. So we do things like auto scale images on the fly. And, and do things like that. So I mean we can define, you know, a whole a whole you know new class of image and then use that. And I made a typo in it, so I'm gonna have to actually uh, actually read it off a of disk, uh, read read it off disk in order to fix it. So once we have that, I mean, we can, we can actually create a new image of that, of that type. I mean, create a total energy plot. And then we can run the simulation. I mean, we can add that plot to what, what, we, what we have in the, in the simulation. Now, it won't show up until, until it starts adding some data to it. So we'll let this run for a second, and then it will it will suddenly pop up in a minute. <coughs> so that's about, that's about it for the demo. I mean, I, I think, you know, in terms of what we're doing with Python, I mean, one of the things we really like is, you know, being able to, to do this stuff sort of interactively. I mean, we can create new, new object types and new images, and eventually we would like to maybe, you know, have a library of this, of this kind of stuff. But for now, I mean, it's very easy to create things 
you know, just kind of create things on the fly and, and interact with the code and play with stuff. And, and it's, it's really kind of neat. So now we have a plot of total energy as a function of time as this thing runs. Now, it's only, it's only got two data points, so it's a straight line. But as the simulation runs, this graph will start to, I mean, we'll start to get more points, and we can start to, we can start to track and see, you know, what is happening with, you know, the, maybe the energy conservation of this system as it, as it runs. And so all three of these, all three of these plots are being updated in, in real time as, as the simulation runs. So we start to see more points added onto that onto, onto that plot. <coughs> so I think that's about it for the demo. Um, I have a few follow-up slides, and then are there any other questions on on what we're doing? With question, question way in the back there. Just sort of a general view of, of how everything works. The the model I'm used to for having a scripting language interact with different codes is that the scripting language acts as uh, a, hope, a hub, if you will, when you start up and you can give it a bunch of commands and you can query on the fly for certain variables. And it decides to pass along to the specific uh, graphics code, analysis code, simulation code, whatever it happens to be. And all the output is up from all those codes and the inputs is always going through the script. Uh, now, I, I gather that that's not really what's happened here. Is that here, the script is just sort of an environment, and things, and it allows things to set up so that the graphics code will be waiting on whether it sees something interactive from the user or whether it sees something from the simulation. Is that is is that true, or is everything still going through sort of a, a, a scripting hub? I would I, I tend to think this is more of sort of a library kind of approach. I mean, sort of our our gra the graphics. The, like the graphics code is, is, is more or less a library. You can think of it as like a C library. And what the scripting language is doing is actually it's providing a, a scriptable interface to that library. So if you type a command and you want to do something in the graphics library, you can type it, you can type it in the scripting language. Now, if the C code underneath, like if some part of the simulation code accesses the graphics library, that's okay too. So it's sort of you can, you know, in, in, in our case, you know, what we do in the scripting language is actually, we might pass like C pointers to things around, but we don't necessarily bring all the data into the scripting language. I mean, it's more of, we're using the scripting language to just hit different library functions and different C functions and, and have them do different things. Now, in the case of this new system, I mean, actually, our data analysis, I mean, all these, all these plots and everything are actually generated by Python code instead of C code. There is some C code underneath to, to do some of the primitives, you know, draw lines and circles and boxes and things like that. But well, I think that's about it for the demo. Um, like I said, this is really, I mean, some of this stuff we didn't have working three days ago because it's, I mean, we're in the process of converting over to Python and, and, you know, I think there's, you know, we want to do it right because, you know, you know, we're trying to, you know, have a lot of interaction with the users of this system to develop something, at least, you know, the, 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 uh, the sort of the top level interface to the, to the graphics in a way that, that is understandable. So just a few follow-up slides. Um, uh, the, sort of the conclusions, I mean, it, I would say that this approach, even though it may, it may look kind of, kind of weird at first, it has really revolutionized the way we work on problems. I mean, we were basically at a dead standstill a year ago uh, due to data. We had too much data. We couldn't look at it. All the tools were broken, and it's just horrible. Um, using this system, we've been able to perform data analysis from our office. We can sit there and we can play around with stuff. Um, we can quickly handle huge data sets. I mean, I've been able to... I've been able to manipulate 100 million particle data sets from the University of Utah at Los Alamos over a T1 internet connection. It takes about 15 to 30 seconds to, you know, to make a picture of that. And 
you know, it's great. Um, of course, it did require me to run interactively on 512 nodes, but we won't go into the cost of that. Um, and I, I think it's, you know, better interaction with the underlying physics. I mean, we really want to know what's going on in there. And it's really nice being able to access, you know, C variables and execute this function and, you know, see what happens. And, you know, I think it's, you know, our current approach has certainly provided us more information than when you use separate tools. I mean, it just eliminated this whole problem of moving data around and trying to figure out how to read this input format and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the approach has certainly encouraged a modular design to the code. Um, before, um, you know, the, the, the MD code kind of had maybe over, gotten somewhat overgrown and kind of, you know, it was sort of this spaghetti-coated mess, and we kind of, we tried to clean it up and, and stuff, but the, the scripting language actually really forced us to try and think about things in a modular way. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, well, I'm going to write this graphics thing, but I know that this is module in you know, my scripting language, so I'm going to try and make this modular. And, and, you know, it may sound difficult, but we were actually able to get rid of 25% of our source code by going to this approach. I mean, a whole bunch of stuff disappeared because we had this, before we had this just really crappy interface. It was a total hack, and it, you know, it's like we got rid of all that, and it was, I mean, it was great. Um, we think that having this sort of flexible, multi-language kind of approach is pretty cool. Um, it's sort of, you know, do what you want and, and see, what you, see what you can do. And really, I, I mean, I think it's, you know, building this application, for, from our standpoint, it doesn't really require all this expensive hardware, like you might get the impression at some of these conferences. Now, as far as the limitations, um, I forgot to have a limit. There are no limitations. Um, no, um, I don't have a slide for this. I think it's, you know, the big limitation right now is still, we've sort of broken the, 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 the model that we had before in terms of what to do in a simulation. Because now everything is just sort of, I mean, you type commands, but what commands do you type and what order do you type them? And and, tr and, and the truth of the matter is there may be no order in which to type them. I mean, you can type them in any order. Um, and that has led to some confusion among, among some of the users because, you know, what they were used to before suddenly no longer, no longer applies or, or it's not clear what, you know, how things are supposed to work in the scripting language. And that may just be a matter of documentation. And, well, our, our user community rapidly developed uh, model input decks which they shared with each other and uh, model library functions with they, which they shared with each other. So I think that's just a... It may be a temporary... A temporary, temporary for the startup phase. Right. And I, th I think another, another sort of general problem is um, I think there is certain a reluctance among some of, you know, some of the people, at least in our, in our group, to, to adopt steering. And I don't, I don't really know the reason for that. I think, I think some of it may be that our early experience um, with this was we got something like AVS, and you know, totally complicated. And it was hard to use, and as a result of that, everyone got this sort of view that anything that was object-oriented, uh, interactive, and you know, tried to do this stuff was just completely it was just complete garbage. I mean, they didn't want anything to do with it because that that early experience was like so horrible that it turned everyone off. So I mean, some of what we're trying to do is you know, you know, try to get people back into this and show them what we're doing. Not so bad to have a few users who don't want it. No. That's, that's a decent paradigm if they're productive with the They're most fun to talk to, to go in there. You go in there and write a special user interface just for them. You know. <laughs> um, future work, uh, like I said, we're, we're, kind of, we're currently working on adopting Python as a, as a core language for this. And, and the main reason for that is we really, we really like Python. It has a really nice, clean syntax. And it has some really powerful features. And, and it's a lot better than my scripting language that I wrote, so <coughs> try to use that. Uh, we're working on some improvements to data analysis and visualization, um, in particular some of the parallel stuff because there just, doesn't, there just isn't that much available that works for that. But I, I don't know. I mean, I sort of, how does that go with this next thing? Uh, we're actually shifting some of our focus to workstations and high-performance file servers instead of these big parallel machines. Um, Unfortunately, we sort of feel that the big parallel machines are basically dead. I mean, all the, all the vendors went out of business. And, you know, and, the, and the performance of these file servers, I mean, we, got, we've got a, we just got a new UltraSpark server and, in our group. And on a per-processor basis, it's 20 times faster than a connection machine. 
And so, you know, we're talking about getting a 10 processor machine. I mean, that's like a 200 processor connection machine in our group. And so we're actually really interested in that, you know, you know, looking at some of these smaller machines, load them up with memory and put a lot of disk on them and, and try to do things like that. And sort of another problem, at least that I'm very interested in, is scientific databases. I mean, we've made it easy to generate lots of images, lots of plots, lots of output. Uh, how do you organize that in some coherent way? Um, in terms of, you know, how do you, you know, have enough data to re reproduce earlier runs and, and describe what you did and, and things like that. And certainly, you know, the last thing we want to do is try to better understand large MD simulations. I mean, steering, I'm not going to claim that steering has solved our scientific problems. Because, I, you know, I think, so, you know, trying to understand these simulations is very difficult. And, it, it, you know, it, it may take five, ten years, I mean, to fully understand you may, you may never understand what these simulations are, but what we have tried to do is actually provide some software that can help us try to do that. I mean, so that, that's, that's one of the things that we're shooting for. So I think that's it.